I am afraid my first news to you must be sad, for it will tell you of the deaths of your friends. Naish, the head gardener, whose boy Alfred was missing at Gallipoli, has just lost his daughter Annie, who had been a VAD nurse for two years. She died after nursing a soldier who had septic pneumonia. She has given her life for the future generations just as much as any soldier who has fallen in the excitement of battle. We have got some new dance music for the gramophone which has caught on. I hope to have the village club as centre of all our village life. We now have a committee composed of both sexes. The social gatherings are a great success, also the whist drives. The sugar ministry allowed us 1,800 weights of sugar and with that amount we are trying to make as much jam out of the surplus fruit in the village as we can. I pay all those who bring fruit to the club the fixed government price, charge all expenses and then if there is any profit, hope to divide it amongst those who bring the fruit. You will all be sorry to hear that George Stockley, who was wounded whilst in Palestine, has died at Cairo. Willie Stockley is missing and Coffin and Maurice Clark are prisoners of war in German hands. Tom Windsor, who was badly wounded, is in number four Scottish General Hospital, Ward B2, Stubhill, Glasgow. He's going on well and says he hopes to be back at Ewan for the combined Hampshire Down Ram Lamb and Berkshire Pig Sale, which this year I hope to hold at the home farm on Wednesday the 7th of August. Herbert Brown was married just before he left the East Coast. Those letters were read by men and women of Ewan Minster, whilst they were far from home, serving in the trenches or in field hospitals during the First World War. Perhaps with their images of village and family, they were the last thing read by a soldier just before he went over the top into enemy fire. They were written by James Ismay, owner of the Ewan Minster estate and employer of most of the people who received them. He wrote regularly in the latter years of the war, doing all that he could to keep Ewan people fighting abroad, in touch with life at home and with the fate of their friends. Probably he hoped that when they returned, country life would resume as before, but it was not to be. The letters were typical of the man, a shy paternalist who took his duty to develop, sustain and protect his community very seriously. In 1908, James Ismay had taken over the Ewan estate from the successors of the second Baron Wolverton, who had already started to create a model village. Ismay pursued many initiatives of his own. He was a passionate reformer of farming methods. He built new cottages and shops developed a bacon factory, underwrote fruit growing and jam making by the local people, built a village club and cinema, and paid for a village nurse and surgery. As well as his wartime letters to the front, which were preserved in the Ewanminster book published after the war, he was also involved in the making of a 1918 Ministry of Information film about two days in the life of the village, showing how a Dorset community carried on despite the conflict. Ewan Minster House, the old Ismay home, is now Claysmore School. On the 14th of January 2003, James Ismay's grandson revisited his birthplace. It was 84 years after the end of the Great War, and 73 years since the Ismays had left Ewan. My name is Wilfred Abel Smith, and my mother was the eldest daughter of James Ismay and, and his second wife, he was born in 1904. And my uh, father and mother married in 1928. I was born in 1929 at Ewan. And of course my grandfather, James Ismay, died about a year later. He was the second uh, son of Thomas Ismay, who founded the White Star Life. And when it was sold, in, I think it was in 1901, to uh, the Morgan interests, his older brother, Bruce, kept on as, uh, as chairman. And I think my grandfather, James Ismay, was, was, was quite happy to, to, to leave and go and do what he always wanted to do, which was to um, live in the country, have a, have, a, have a country estate, and practice all sorts of new farming methods, which he was always very keen on, which is exactly what he did. My grandmother did tell me that uh, the 
the maiden voyage of the Titanic. My grandfather was supposed to be on it as a guest, but he was he was very old with pneumonia. Luckily, I suppose, and so he was at Ewan. Well, as I understand it, um, my grandfather, who was obviously over the age of sort of general general service in, in the army, um, wanted to do something to defend the defend the country. So he had his car armoured. I think there was a specialist company that that did that. I get the impression that he was in various places in Sussex and the south of England, and he obviously took took the armoured car with him, and, and uh, he must have spent a large a lot of the early parts of the of the war, I suppose, from up to nineteen sometime in nineteen sixteen, um, doing 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 do, doing that, and he obviously had a a crew. I, I, was, I gather from the from the various letters that were recruited from Ewan, Ewan men, and there's a, there's a picture of them, of them here with him. There are now perhaps five people living in the village who are descended from the Ewan Minster families of 1918. John Brooks is one of them. Although his father, Charlie, doesn't appear in the old film itself, he does feature often in the Ismay letters. John Brooks and Wilfred Abel Smith met for the first time by James Ismay's tomb. Great thoughts, great feelings came to him like instincts unawares. Well, I was never told that um, Mr. Ismay had uh, grandchildren. It was more, they told you um, about how Mr. Ismay died and yeah, what he'd done yeah. for the village, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. Well, he was very fond of the village, obviously. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, I yeah. gather that. And my mother always loved it here, too. Though, though I can't remember him myself, mm -hmm. I can remember when the day of the funeral um, came out the church in, in my mother's arms and uh, the cortege came up here and that was all I can remember, nothing else. Well, it's pretty good memory. For I you, was two yeah, years old. Two years old well, a lot of people won't believe yeah. it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I can I yeah. remember it as if it yeah. was yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Well, I guess I was only five months old when you yeah. died, so and, yeah. and obviously I hadn't lived here with my mother. I just, yeah. just you were at the house, were you then? Well, I, I suppose at the funeral, yeah. my mother would have been here, whether yeah. she'd left me in London, I don't know. but. Uh, I, I was actually born in the house. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. The thing is, a lot of people now, these days, don't appreciate um, what a man like Mr. Ismay did for a small community. Uh -huh. They guys work, and there was, I suppose everybody worked for the estate. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they work, yeah. they, they travel from here to Bournemouth. Uh, they, yeah. they commute to London. That's why me. our roads are always so congested. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> July 29th, 1918. We expect to have a fete here next month, so as to collect money for our prisoners of war fund. And I hope we shall soon have Charlie Brooks back from Roehampton, fitted with a new leg. He made a most persuasive collector. December 19th, 1918. Charlie Brooks has decided to become the hair cutter and barber of Ewan and all the surrounding villages. I thought it was advisable that he should first try on the people not living in Ewan, so I wrote to the hairdressers where I usually go to in London, suggesting he should be taken on by them so as to learn the trade. It is better that he should learn on other people first then become an A1 barber at Hales, and finally bring his knowledge to Ewan without any discomfort to us. My father was um, Charlie Brooks, a village barber. Um, he was quite a character, really. Um, he went. He was born in Ewan Minster, and he went to school at, uh, at Ewan Minster. He served in the First World War. Uh, he was in the Battle of the Somme, where he lost a, a leg. And uh, when he came back, uh, Mr. Ismay set him up as a village barber. He was the owner and he, he, he worked there on his own, except for Saturday 
No, it's when his brother used to come down and help him out. Because he, he used to have as many as perhaps 20, 30 people in there uh, to cut their hair. And he, he worked from half past eight in the morning till eight at night. Um, he used to shut the shop and he used to walk down the road to the local pub and have his couple of pints of beer. And uh, that was it, he's back home at 10 o'clock. He kept the gun in the shop for the purpose of, if he heard a pigeon cooing uh, up in a local tree, he uh, used to creep out quietly and uh, shoot it, and we had that next day for dinner. In those days, you could roam more or less where you wanted to, uh, providing you didn't do damage. Uh, when, when I was a boy, we used to uh, probably go as far as Hambledon Hill from here, um, all the surrounding woods, and uh, we used to, three or four of us used to take sausages and uh, eggs and have a tin and, and light the fire and cook them up and eat them. And those sort of things are gone now. Uh, the modern children, there's more television computers and that sort of thing. December 1917, the War Savings Association is doing well. Mr Spencer has given some extremely interesting lectures in the school, illustrated by lantern slides, which have been well attended. It is hoped that after Christmas we may be able to run a cinematograph with both amusing and educational slides. Perhaps we may even have Charlie Chaplin on the film. The gardens and allotments have all done well this last year. The potatoes have been a big success. November the 26th, 1918. The Ewan film is a great success and I have been busy, with the help of Mrs Ismay and Mr Spencer, in choosing titles for the different subjects. Mrs W Green is shown with her children. That picture we have called Domestic Happiness, Knitting Socks for Father. I am sure you will all be pleased with the pictures when you see them, and I sincerely hope that time will not be long distant. My name is Geoffrey Frank Spencer and I grew up in Ewan Minster. My grandparents on my father's side moved here from Luton in Devon just before the First World War to become the village school teachers. My father was actually born in the village. My grandfather and grandmother taught at this school from before the First World War right through until the Second World War when my grandfather retired and my grandmother then became headmistress. Teacher salaries in the 20s and 30s were actually very generous and when the estate broke up in, the in 1930 and was sold, my grandfather was able to buy two houses in the village and several plots of land. The salaries were cut later. My grandmother carried on until 1951. My mother, as it happens, also attained a post at the school and taught there for over 20 years so that the present day older residents of Ewan Minster were mostly taught to read and write by her. In the Ewan film, which was made in August 1918, my mother is seen as a tiny tot next to a pushchair with my Aunt Winifred, right outside the gates of the school, which were here. My grandfather, Percy, is seen walking down the high street with his charges. The Spencer family has dispersed throughout the country and abroad, although Frank still lives a few miles from Ewan. Very hard work. They were under the thumb of the, of the vicar, who was nothing to do with the Lord of the Manor, and I must emphasise that. The vicar was, ran his own affairs and uh, was part aristocracy anyway, so uh, he, he just uh, was in charge of my, my grandparents. They, they were also subject, of course, to the law of the land, and the school went up to the age of 14, and so the big boys were pretty hardened farm Dorset lads. Uh, some of them had walked for miles to come to the school, and uh, it was a tough life, I would imagine. They were dedicated to the church, my grandfather being the, the church warden and organist. Uh, wives didn't have an independent say in the affair anyway, I don't think, but no, they loved it dearly and they were, they were record keepers, chroniclers of the of village life as well as 
being a, a leading social factor. I don't know why they never considered moving. My father, when the Cooperative Society, Ewan Minster and Child Active Cooperative Society, closed down in 1958, had a very difficult choice to make because the new head offices were in Longfleet House in Poole. And he either had to move to Poole or nearby or commute. So from 1958 he was commuting all the way to Poole, one of the early long distance commuters, because he loved the village so much. I think villages just do attract that kind of uh, love. Biggest change was the breakup of the estate. Ismay died young in 1930. The estate was sold soon after. A lot of the land became individual farms, the Wareham family being the great exception because they always owned their own land or at least had enough independence not to have to listen to the squire. But that is that was the big change, and people were given a, a, a choice. Buy your own house for £100, £200, or essentially find somewhere to live. Maybe you can live where you are, but you have to pay rent to whoever does buy it. That was the big change, and it affected all village life. The, the source of funding for a lot of village events was suddenly gone. The village hall was, became a private house and closed down. The village did get together and produce a new village hall, but it took a long time. The other big event was, of course, the Second World War and the effect that had. Though people mustn't imagine that there were not newcomers to villages. We, we have this image that villages were static, ingrown, and there was no influx of people. My own grandparents were incomers. There were colonels and majors moving in after both the wars. Most of the people who were servants at the Great House, their families had moved on. The children that I grew up with in the 50s. There's a few of them still around, but not, not necessarily local. Those families, their parents might live in Ewan still, a few of them do, but none of the next generation. But then things change. January 1918. So far, learning has gone on well, but Spracklin this year will miss the cake he has always had. May the 24th, 1918. We have just commenced shearing. This year we cannot get the usual shearing gang, so Spracklin and the other shepherds have taken on the job. It will keep them pretty busy, for it is, of course, in addition to their ordinary work. Spracklin does not believe in a shearing machine. June 1918. Spracklin and the shepherds managed to shear all the sheep. Rather a hard task for them when one considers the other work they had to do. Still, they got through it well and with good heart. Derek Pike is the only person still living in the village who descends from someone who had a prominent part in the 1918 film. I'm standing at the top of Urine Hill. Urine itself lies about a mile down the road. It's in these cottages over here that my grandfather used to live in the early 1900s. My grandfather was Mr. Sprackland, who was shepherd for Mr. Ismay, and appeared in the film that he made on Euron. My grandparents had several children, many of whom would have had to walk down to school, down the hill, and then back up at night. And on Sundays, of course, they would go down to Sunday school, back up and then down again and back up to the main service. So they were, must have been pretty fit, I think, in those days. And of course, when it snowed, the snow came right across the hedges going down Ewan Hill and, and they would literally be snowbound. As far as I know, he, he must have got a job somewhere else and then retired from there to Winners near Reading. I certainly didn't know him when he lived in Ewan, but uh, my mother, she kept all the things of his, so we had quite a little bit of memoranda about him. We have um, his uh, one of, at least one of his uh, certificates from the Smithfield show where he was uh, presented as being champion feeder, but he did have a lot of those, I remember it, uh, winners, they were all round the wall. but. Uh, when the family died, they must have been distributed amongst the seven children that he had. My father lived at the top of Ewan Hill, of course, close 
to Mr. Sprackland. And that's how my mother and father must have got together because they went to school together. My father, of course, he worked at the Dorset Bacon Factory, which was one of Mr. Ismay's uh, things at home farm. And then he became the chief sausage maker. So that uh, when I became a butcher and we bought the butcher's shop here eventually, he, he was well versed in making good sausages. When I came out of the Air Force, I first worked in the woods for Mr. Rolf Gardner. Uh, didn't seem to be getting very far, so I thought I'd better change my career. And I went to Sainsbury's in London and uh, trained to become a butcher. After a couple of moves, I moved to Andover for a while and then moved to Wareham for a while. And then my father turned up one day and said that the shop in Eurominster was coming up for sale. Did, it, did we think we ought to have a go? And so we had a, had a go, went to the bank and got a big mortgage and uh, came back to Euron and uh, that's where I'd been for 25 years until I retired, which was uh, you know, about 20 years ago, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Ismay gave uh, red cloaks to all the young ladies of the village. This one actually belonged to my mother. Her name is there, Maud Sprackland, and she was the daughter of Mr. Sprackland, the shepherd. It's a, it's a lovely little thing with a hood, obviously of a very good quality. Lovely. She was very lucky, all the girls in the village, to have one like that. James Ismay basically went round controlling people's lives. If he saw a dock growing in a field, he would get an implement, a dock removing implement, and remove it and leave it hanging on the gate as a reproach to whoever went past. He insisted that all the colours of the curtains in the windows should be the same. He had an estate colour, but then lots of estates had estate colours of their own. But on the other hand, he ploughed his family fortune into the estate. He wasn't just high society with big parties and shooting gatherings. Well, he, he was very liked. He, he, he um, uh, I should say, he, he was a good man. And, uh, of course, you get the odd one or two people that I've heard that um, probably didn't like him, which you get in all walks of life. But uh, mainly what he'd done for my father and... I've heard it said other people in the village. In fact, um, there was one lady I was told that uh, had appendicitis in the village. Uh, in those days, it was very serious because um, people couldn't afford an operation. You had to pay, and he actually paid for and paid for the operation and her convalescence after. He was genuinely interested in doing good for the village and making the very best that he could of the village facilities. He was a moderniser. He was an agricultural reformer. He was determined that uh, Ewan should be the best model village there was. That is quite different from simply taking the money and, and, and paying your people and letting them live in old cob houses. I think he's remembered as a man who, who, with a lot of religious faith, and uh, he liked the, every, everything to be done perfectly. Uh, he was very fastidious. My father told me, who obviously only, only knew him later on in life, that he was getting very worried in the, in the late twenties about the financial situation and the stock market crash and so on. I think he'd also had a a bad knock on the head from a boom. And so he died rather young. Well, he died, I think he was 60, 63 when he died in 1930. Well, my mother, she uh, enjoyed her growing up here terribly. I think she missed it a lot. And so uh, 
she, will, she always wanted to be buried here. And uh, several of her relations said to me, I didn't, they didn't realize she liked it so much. And I said, oh, she did. But I think she'd see, see the, the change is rather, is, is, is rather, rather sad. I think she probably would have preferred it the way it was. Most of the, um, the um, children of the, the, the uh, people I went to school with, they, they've moved out and gone from the village. Um, you can understand it really because there wasn't a great lot of work in the village at that time. I know uh, our immediate neighbours, but it's quite a few, I should say, uh, three quarters of the, the population of you, and I don't know, because you never meet them. There's a lot of uh, children who would like to come back to the village, but they can't afford the prices of the houses now. And we, we were lucky, really, because uh, this was a council property and we got a, a, quite a big discount. And um, I retired and my daughter's taken it on and we, we live here together. There are people that have got two houses, they live in London, they, they buy a, a holiday house here. People retire here, whereas back in my youth they were all working community. They all had jobs in the village. They all had children. I mean, that was one of the reasons why the village school had to close, because um, there were so few children going. Well, the, the villagers, of course, are completely different than they used to be in mine when I was a boy. I mean, we used to live on the main roads. And I can remember playing cricket across the main roads. We used to chalk some stumps up on the wall and uh, play literally across the, the road and car, well the car was just uh, something about once an hour. <laughs> uh, apart from that, I mean, the village had, had everything that it hasn't got anymore now. There was a, a bank that was open at least two or three days a week, had a blacksmith, had a nurse, Saddlers, had a co-op, all sorts of places like that. A place where they made ice cream, a local person who used to have a little bus and used to uh, be a carrier and used to have trips to Salisbury and buses every hour. So it's, it's completely different now. Well, the agricultural labour force has completely dwindled to almost nil. That You don't need vast numbers of stockmen anymore. One of the great disasters in Ewan, I think, socially, was the, the, the failure of the economies on dairy farming, for instance, and the disappearance of the herds. Uh, the, and before that, the bacon factory itself closed down and, and cheese making and butter making ceased even before. But there's not even the, the mechanics anymore that kept the machinery going and for the tractors, the, the ordinary ploughmen, nothing like that exists anymore. It's all contractors thundering around the, the area doing one field and then rushing off. And that, without an agricultural core, I think the villages do have a problem. The, the family produced much more. Uh, you had a garden, you produced your own vegetables, kept chicken. Um, there was a, young people today, they won't eat th uh, things like rabbits, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I know that for a fact, <laughs> but uh, we did. We, we, uh, you were brought up, pheasants, uh, rabbits, deer, that sort of food, and it, it was cheap. You had to have a lot of money if you're going to buy a place here because it's one of the most sought after villages in Dorset I would have thought and uh, there are very few what they call starter homes around here and so presumably you would do need a lot of money just to actually come and live in the village. When you're a boy, 
or at least when I was a boy and lived here, I used to think, well, what a boring place to live. <laughs> and then when you go away and you see how other people have to live, and then you come back and you think, well, how lucky I am to have had a childhood in a place like this. So I really wouldn't want to live anywhere else. So, you know, that's basically it. I was born here, I was brought up here. Um, I consider that uh, I'm a village person. Um, quite proud of it as well. Um, there's nobody else that I can uh, recall that uh, whose family go back as far as ours does in the village. My son has done a family tree and he's traced it back. Ewanminster House, Blandford, August 1918. From Ewan and Sutton, we send you all good wishes, and May 1918 see you all back at home again. As the 24th of May, Empire Day, the date of this letter, comes while school children have a week's holiday, we are putting off our Empire Day celebrations until school starts again. Empire Day has become a living force, and it helps us all here to realize how the whole empire is fighting for freedom in the future, and the final downfall of militarism. Now I am sure that not one of you will think I am becoming a schoolmaster if I give you a little lecture. I know it is often extremely difficult for you to write lectures. You know that all of you are in our thoughts and when a mother, a wife or a friend does not receive a letter for some weeks, it makes them feel anxious and they wonder if possibly some unpleasant thing may have happened to you. I know none of you will mind my putting this point to you. I had an interesting day on the 6th when I went down to Mudford, not far from Yeovil, to see a milking competition. There were about 130 competitors. Mr Holloway motored me down and also took Mr Charles Trowbridge, Mr Spencer, who has taken the Vale Farm, and Mr Cox. All these acted as judges. It was a perfect day. Mr Holloway is, 
a little erratic in taking his corners, but we got to Mudford and back without any accident. I hope to get these milking competitions started in Dorset. Such competitions help to make country life more attractive. I don't think I ever told you that I am one of the members of the Dorset Agricultural Wage Board, nominated by the Board of Agriculture. On Monday the 17th, we started a cheese-making class at the dairy. It's run by the county council. The class is not allowed to number more than 12, and consists of Grace Bartlett, Flossie Crabb, Hugh Holloway, Maud Sprackland, Mrs Mullet, and four from outside the village. The demonstrator is a county council official, and most efficient. Somewhat difficult to write this three weekly letter, for you at the different fronts are making history and giving us at home all the splendid news. In France, Mesopotamia, Palestine, and Italy, we read in the papers of what you are doing to get rid of the Hun brutes, as Mr. Balfour has so correctly named them. On Monday the 15th, Salisbury Sheep Fair took place. Sprackland and all of us thought we should bring back the cup to Ewan for the best pen of ram lambs. But the quality of the ram lambs shown was so good that we had to be content with the second prize. The first went to Mr. Williams, who has got best as his shepherd. Mrs. Rouse Boughton and I went to the lunch given by the mayor at the town hall. I found that I uh, had to make a speech. I expect you have seen in the papers long accounts of people waiting for hours to buy food at the shops. Well, this has not been the case in Ewan and Sutton, for I do not think, with the exception of butter, which is scarce, that anyone has had to go short. The trouble in the towns is probably due to the difficulty of distribution, but this is being rapidly overcome. The Germans would like you at the front to believe that there is a shortage of food in Great Britain, but I can honestly assure you that if people have had to suffer a certain inconvenience in the past, that will soon be done away with. Naturally, we shall not have as much as we had before the war, and the bread is not as white. Still, that is nothing compared with the want sustained by the Germans for the last two years. We at home, and I am not speaking for myself only, feel that if we can help our allies by sending some of our food to them, then we are doing our small bit. We should be proud that we can do something. Lord Stalbridge is selling a good deal of his land, including the towns of Shaftesbury and Stalbridge. This is owing to the high death duties, taxation, etc. The dry cows and heifers are doing well on the ensilage. We are producing more milk from the home farm this year than we have ever done. Mr. Anderson Graham, the editor of Country Life, came here this week to write an article on farming in wartime. I hope to send you each a copy of the paper. Ewan has really got a good name for doing its best in the war. We've certainly done so in the number of those who are now at the front, and I must say that those at home are working so well. You will be glad to know that Frank Whittle, who was my dairyman, is now a sergeant and has been awarded the DCM. On Sunday the 4th, both Keeper Bill Green, now in the Marines, and Keeper Jimmy Smith were at Ewan. Green told me that the life in the army was good, and when I asked him how he liked physical drill, he promptly, and in a very military fashion, showed me he could touch his toes. Jimmy Smith, who has quite recovered from his last wound, is now an instructor in signalling, 
As one of the UN Boy Scouts, he always was keen at dots and dashes, flag wagging. You also told me that his father and mother, whom you will remember at UN, were both fit and well. I sent my younger brother, who for some time was in France, in the Lancers, and is now at a remount depot, a copy of the breeder's bloodstock magazine, which contained a long account of the progeny of Craganor. You will remember my brother won the derby with Craganor, but the horse was disqualified on account of bumping. It was the derby when the suffragettes created trouble, and one poor girl was killed when she tried to stop the race by running onto the course, and was trampled on by the horses. Keeper Green joined up on the 13th. I could have possibly got him exempted if he would have let me appeal, but he said he would rather I did not. Hemery, my butler, is also called up. Leslie Cool, who helps his father in the cow stalls, and whom I would have got off if I had appealed, for he is doing absolutely war work, would not let me appeal. Trowbridge has gone into the RN division. His joining up has made a considerable difference to me, for he knew all the details of the estate. Burstow, the new clerk, invalided out of the service, is doing his best to get in touch with things as soon as he can. Tom Windsor and Amy Wareham were married on Wednesday, July the 10th. He has set a good example to you all, and I hope on the successful termination of the war, we shall have many happy marriages in the village. Fred was best man. It was lucky that he was home on leave. I had to go up to London on Tuesday, and so could not be at the wedding, but Mrs. Rouse Bowden went. On Friday the 15th, we had another cinema exhibition. Amongst the films shown was an excellent one, the work done by the RAMC in France. The scenes we saw appealed strongly to everyone. My only trouble with the cinema is the lack of seating room. A good many people had to be turned away. You can all rest content about your people at home. They are fit and well. There is no sickness in the village. All we want is to see you back once more. But I am sure none of you will want to return until you have won many long years of peace and destroyed all hope of a German military power running the world. There are now over 40 German prisoners of war working on the land here and helping to replant at Ewan. It is very strange to feel that some of those who are working for me have got British prisoners of war on their farms in Germany. Our collection for our prisoners of war in enemy hands is going ahead well. Charlie Brooks made an excellent and most persuasive collector. I took him into Dorchester on the 28th to be measured for a temporary leg. That is the wish not only of you who are abroad, but of your people at home. Still, when that time does come, every one of you will be only too thankful that he is able to play his part freeing the world from any fear of Prussian militarism. Life would not be worth living for the children or their children if such a force was in power. Another long letter was from Albert Locke, who wishes me to tell everyone that he is in the pink. I suppose it must be rather warm in India. Bob Dominey has at last had a postcard from Fred Coffin, who sent it from Stendhal, a German prisoner of war camp.
latest news from all the fronts is excellent. Mr. Lloyd George has told us all to hold fast. You are doing more than that. You are getting forward. Carry your thoughts to 2018, 100 years hence, when probably many more people will travel on the Blandford Shaftesbury Road than did in 1918. That cross and those names will remind them of the Four Years' World War, the result of which, by your efforts, justice, equity and freedom were reassured to your descendants by the magnificent courage and self-sacrifice of those whose names are on the tablet and of countless others from villages and towns in Great Britain and our sister states beyond the seas. I had a shooting party here on the 11th and 12th. All the guns were on leave from abroad. Fred Wareham and Edric were among the beaters. We were just finishing a partridge drive over the Sutton Road when the church bells rang out and told us the great news. Then the cheers went forth from everyone, a thank offering for the glorious victory you have won. The church and stable clocks now strike at night. No need to keep all lights darkened. And greater than all, no fear that we shall get a telegram from the war office saying that some relative has fallen. We are looking forward to the day when you all get back for the village wants you. The married ones will find their homes much better furnished than they were when they left, as their wives have seen to that. And the unmarried ones will, I hope, find cottages all ready for them as soon as they are married. You have seen things we have not seen and do not want to see. You have gone through hard and bitter times, and when you return, you will have much to tell us. <laughs> 